Okay, we are now live on YouTube. Um, welcome everybody. Um, for some reason, for some reason I'm still stuck on your video, Kai. Um, can you check whether that's true on the live stream? Um, okay, welcome everybody to this uh, first online event uh, from the Institute of Quantum Studies. Uh, my name is Matt Liefer. I'm the co-director of the Institute of Quantum Studies here at Chapman University. And uh, we usually have a public lecture series in normal times. Um, and we decided to try and make a go of doing some online events this semester. So this is our first experiment in doing that. Um, and so I hope you all enjoy it. Um, our guest today is Sean Carroll. Um, he'll be well known to, to many of you. Um, he was actually due to speak here uh, back in April, uh, just before all the campus shutdowns happened. So he's graciously agreed uh, to come back and try this with us uh, in September. Um, Sean is a research professor at Caltech. Um, he specializes in pretty much everything that's fundamental in physics, um, quantum mechanics, gravitation, cosmology, statistical mechanics, uh, and everything under the sun pretty much. Um, he's the author of uh, five books, one textbook and uh, four popular science books. His latest book is called Something Deeply Hidden, um, which we will be talking about today. And we'll also have a book giveaway. Uh, I have 20 copies of this book to give away. Uh, so that will happen towards the end. Um, what else to say? Uh, Sean is also uh, the host of the Mindcast podcast, which I recommend uh, you, you check out if you haven't done so already. Is kind of the left wing Sam Harris in my in my view. <laughs> so um, welcome to welcome welcome to the live stream, Sean. Thanks very much for having me. Mindscape, by the way, this is the Mindscape. name of the podcast. What did I say? Mindcast, I think. My, okay, sorry. <laughs> Which was equally good as a name, but it's not the one I picked. <laughs> Mindscape, yeah, you should check that out. Um, okay, so the plan for today is we're going to talk uh, talk for about fifty minutes or an hour or so. Uh, we'll do the book giveaway, and there'll be an audience Q and A. Um, we have our very own uh, Professor Kai Wagel will be moderating the chat room and helping us with the Q&A Q &A later. Um, so uh, say hi to him in the chat room. Um, okay, so uh, I want to spend most of this talking about fundamental physics because, you know, we've had a lot of, uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world today and I hope that this will be a little bit of an escape from it. But uh, to acknowledge where we are, um, I just wanted to sort of acknowledge what's going on. Um, I remember back in April when I first uh, sent you the email canceling to cancel this event, um, you wrote back to me and you said, this is a quote, um, look at all the free time I have over the next couple of months to get work done. Um, so I just wanted to know six months later, how, how did that go for you? Well, there's a famous quote attributed to Niels Bohr that uh, it's very hard to predict things, especially about the future. And that was uh, definitely an example of that in action. I've never been very good at predicting the future anyway. Um, you know, there's two competing things. One is in some sense, there is more free time. In another sense, it's hard to get work done. <laughs> there's many other things to worry about, even if not productively. So I took the strategy that uh, there were a lot of things I was supposed to be doing and it would probably be hard to do those. So I would do something productive that wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. And I launched a video series uh, called The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. So like I did everything. I went out and bought a green screen and lights and uh, bought software to edit videos. And so I did that basically all summer and created, you know, 40 or 50 hours worth of videos you can find on YouTube about physics. Uh, but now that's done and I actually am back into doing work and it's kind of going well. Okay, good to hear that. I, I mean, I think a lot of us uh, had the idea that, you know, when this, when the campus shutdown started to happen, that we would have so much free time. Um, I know, you would it think. It really hasn't <laughs> turned out that way for me. Um, okay, so I want to I talk about your book. Um, I'm going to start, there's a, lot of, there's a lot that we disagree with in, about in this book. Um, I, people may not know, but I'm not... Uh, uh, many worlds uh, Everett interpretation advocates, so I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about. Not yet, anyway. Um, but I wanted to start by uh, talking about the prologue in the book because that's the thing that we agree on. It's kind of it starts with a call to arms that we should care seriously about uh, the foundations of quantum mechanics and uh, being 
in one of the few research institutes in the country that actually cares about that kind of research. Uh, that was music to my ears. Um, so I wanted to ask you why, uh, you know, why do you think it's important to work on the foundations of quantum mechanics in particular now? So what is it about the state of physics now that makes now a good time to, to think about these issues? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a number of reasons why. The first can be succinctly summed up by saying, duh, of course it's important to worry about the foundations of quantum mechanics. It's the most important, central, fundamental, successful physical theory we have, and we don't understand it. That's like, incredibly embarrassing. Uh, you know, I, I, I've said it before, 500 years from now, the historians of science will look at the 20th century and be incredibly impressed with all the progress that was made, not only quantum mechanics, but also relativity, field theory, cosmology, condensed matter physics. But they'll, but they'll be baffled. They're, they'll be you know, thinking to themselves, why in the world didn't they try to understand what was going on at, in this most central piece of their theory? So purely out of intellectual interest, you know, purely out of the reason why we all do physics in the first place, understanding quantum mechanics should be part of it. But I also think that there is a more practical thing. The why now question is a, an interesting one. And I think there's two things going on there. One is that as often happens in physics, technology pushes us to do it, right? Uh, we can ignore things for a while until we can't anymore. And these days, the you know, one, one of the ways in which we understood quantum mechanics back in the 30s was to draw a line between the classical world and the quantum world. And that line is getting fuzzier and getting easier to cross over as we're manipulating things that are on the boundary of that. And for good reason, we're trying to build quantum computers and quantum cryptography and quantum money and whatever you want. So understanding quantum mechanics uh, at a fundamental level, including things like entanglement, right? Not just calculate amplitude and square it, right? You know, the more subtle aspects of quantum mechanics do become very relevant because of this technology. And the final reason is, you know, I, I just think that there is, uh, well, let's put, it, let's put it in the harshest possible terms. Fundamental physics has slowed down, right? Uh, if, the, if the 500 years from now, historians will be really impressed with progress in fundamental physics in the first half of the 20th century, mm -hmm. the second half was, if you, again, want to be a little bit uncharitable, the second half of the 20th century was about consolidating all the wonderful gains we made in the first half of the 20th century. And the first half of the 21st century, progress is slower. Not in physics, in physics, things are going to beat the band, but what we think of traditionally as fundamental physics, particle physics, you know, big universe cosmology, things like that, we're still working with the same theories we put together in the 70s and 80s. Um, so in the face of that kind of situation, you can either sort of shrug your shoulders and try to do something different, which a lot of people have done. Uh, you can stubbornly press on, which people have done. And also it's not completely crazy because who knows when the next breakthrough is going to be. But also you can take a step back and start thinking about the foundations. I mean, maybe there's an angle toward these questions of, you know, what is the universe made of? Why do the particles have the properties they do? Why quantum field theory is the right answer? How to quantize gravity? Maybe understanding quantum mechanics at a more fundamental level will help us with these questions. And now we have, you know, it's like me at the beginning of the pandemic. Now we have all the time to think about these things because we're not being surprised by new experimental results. Right, yeah, I mean, it seems to me that um... Historically, there's been sort of two thrusts which have push, pushed people to think more about the foundations of quantum mechanics. One of them does come from um, cosmology and quantum gravity and things like that. The idea that there's no observer outside the universe. And, you know, John Wheeler and Everett were pushing this kind of point of view, you know, back in the 50s uh, because of that. Uh, so that's one thrust that has led people to think about it. And the other one is quantum technologies and quantum computing and quantum information. So this idea that, um, you know, so the idea there is that all of these things that were previously thought of as paradoxical and problematic turn out to have very useful applications. And when you're thinking about that, you sort of turn around and think, well, I actually need to understand how these things work. Right. And that's kind of, I guess you, you're coming at these problems from the formal point of view, your backgrounds in cosmology and things like that. And I, my backgrounds in, quantum information, and that's the, the point of view that, that I come to these, these questions from. But it seems like these two uh, points of view are kind of fusing these days, and there's a sort of, um, 
yeah, fusion of these information theoretic kinds of ideas with the ones coming from fundamental physics. And you talk a bit about that in your book, and hopefully we're going to get to it uh, a bit later in this conversation. Um, and we should probably, along those lines, give credit to people in the philosophy of physics who have sort yes. of kept the torch alive in these areas for a long time, while mainstream physicists kind of ignored it. So, um, you know, I always say, again, half jokingly, that philosophers are really good at telling you why your theory is bad. Uh, they're less good at coming up with a better theory, but they absolutely have contributed uh, in important ways to understanding what the issues are and how we might go about solving them or at least addressing them in uh, the foundations of quantum mechanics. So it's not just technology and, and you know, the boredom of physicists that leads us there. Yes, it is one of the, one, at least one area in physics where I think that interactions, I may mean, have certainly found interactions with philosophers to be very useful. Um, not, not so many physicists have that opinion. No. <laughs> That's okay, well, um, so we have a bit of a problem, which is that we have to explain to the audience um, what all of the general problems with quantum mechanics are and why, why you think Everett is a good solution to them in a relatively short amount of time. I mean, really, they should all go out and buy the book and find out in detail. Um, but what I'd like you to do, if you can, in you know, say five minutes or so, is let, let's sort of hone in on what you think are like the really biggest problems, and certainly from your point of view, that we have with our understanding of quantum mechanics. What are they, um, and why? Uh, well, and explain what you what to you the Everettian solution to that is, and why you think that's a good solution. So if you can do all that in uh, 30 seconds, that would be great. Sure, I can do that. Just, you know, <laughs> you might want to like uh, increase the speed on the YouTube video. Listen, to, listen to 1.5 speed if you're not, if you're bored. But um, look, you know, quantum mechanics comes along the way that I like to rationally reconstruct it. Physicists never care about the real history, but they make up a fake history in their heads that makes more logical sense. So in my mind, the, the fake history uh, starts with the fact that we put this thing together called the atom, right? The Rutherford atom, where there was a, nucleus at the center of the atom and there's electrons moving around in what look like a solar system orbit, but that's wildly unstable by the laws of classical mechanics. Those electrons should be giving off radiation and falling into the middle. So we previously had had the idea from Einstein and Planck and others that what we thought was a wave, namely light, had particle-like properties. So some bright people said, well, maybe the reason why electrons don't fall into the center of the nucleus is because this particle has wave-like properties. And in fact, depending on your point of view, and we'll, we'll talk about this later on, maybe it just is a wave. Maybe you should just think of the electron as a wave. It's not a particle at all. That could be a point of view. And that actually does help solve the problem of why the electron doesn't fall into the center of the nucleus. It sort of settles down to a stable shape for the wave rather than being a moving particle that should give off radiation. The problem is that when you shoot an electron through a detector, through a cloud chamber or something like that, you don't see a wave. You don't see some sort of big puffy thing move out. You see a little line as if there's a particle moving in a certain direction. So it, it was a struggle in the 1920s and, and, and so forth to reconcile that sometimes they were like waves, sometimes they were like particles. And so the resolution that physicists came up with was um, there's this thing called the wave function for, that describes an electron. And when you're not measuring the electron, when you're not observing it, when you're not performing a measurement, the rules of what happens to that wave function are very standard and understandable by physics terms, right? We know what the wave function is. There's an equation, the Schrodinger equation that tells us how it evolves. But we need a separate set of rules for what the outcomes are when we measure it. And that's unlike any other theory ever in the history of physics, where in principle, if you tried hard enough, you could just measure the system. In quantum mechanics, there's something special about measuring the system. And the rules say that you don't ever see the wave function as a whole. What you see is a particle looks like it has a position. And what the relationship is, is that the probability of seeing the particle in that position is given by the wave function squared, the famous Born rule of quantum mechanics. So you can't even predict exactly what you're going to measure. And what you measure is not the same language as you use to describe the system when you're not measuring it. And after you measure it, the wave function has changed in a dramatic way. So there's all these extra rules that go along in conventional quantum mechanics and what we teach our students with um, that are required to understand quantum mechanics that are completely unique to quantum mechanics, nowhere else in the rest of physics. 
And there's one other feature that will turn out to be important later, which was emphasized by Einstein. You know, people like, it, it's not like the theory came on the scene in 1927 and everyone went, oh yeah, that's probably right which sometimes does happen, um, but didn't happen with quantum mechanics. People like Einstein and Schrodinger, who invented the Schrodinger equation, you know, like big names who should uh, get some credit here, said, you know, we're, it's just not plausible that this story you're telling us is the final theory of the universe. And so one of the things that Einstein emphasized was this thing we now call entanglement. And, you know, one way I like to look at it is, you know, if you have two particles, two electrons coming in. Let's see if Zoom lets you see my fingers. Two particles come in and they scatter off of each other, right? Um, well, quantum mechanics says you can't predict exactly the angle they'll, they'll scatter off of, but you can predict a probability to measure it in different angles. But meanwhile, momentum is conserved. So you don't know the probability of particle one going off in any direction, and you don't know the probability of particle two going off in any direction. But if you measure what particle one does, you instantly know what particle two must be doing because of conservation of momentum. You can just work it out, right? So somehow the, the short version of the story is individual particles don't have their own wave functions. There is one wave function that describes the combined collection of both particles and they can be entangled. The state that you might measure for one particle is related to the state you might measure with the other. So then Hugh Everett comes along in the 1950s and says, you know what I don't like about quantum mechanics is that this story of measuring things seems to treat the observers as classical, as if they still live in Newtonian world, whereas the thing they're observing is quantum mechanical. I, Everett says, think that the observer should be quantum mechanical also. The observer has a wave function. And what really happens when the observer measures a system is not that the wave function dramatically changes. It's just the Schrodinger equation all the time. That's all that ever happens. But the Schrodinger equation predicts that the observer and the system become entangled. And rather than the, what the quantum textbooks teach us, which is that the scattered particle could go in any direction and there's a probability of observing it in different directions. Everett says, every possible outcome that you might have thought you could have measured actually comes true. There's a world in which the electron goes this way and the observer saw it go, go that way, a world in which the electron goes this way and the observer saw it go that way, etc. And he claims furthermore, the amazing thing is he doesn't put in all these worlds. You know, he says they were there in the space of all possible wave functions all along. If you believe the electron can be in a superposition of different possibilities, then the universe should be in a superposition of different possibilities. And so it, it, in terms of the underlying mathematical formalism, it's just about the simplest, most, most lean and mean uh, formulation of quantum mechanics you can find. But in terms of connection to what we observe, it's the biggest stretch. So if I'm, if I'm being fair about the problems of Everettian quantum mechanics, you have to take a bit of a story into account to map on the pristine, elegant beauty of the underlying formalism to the messy reality of the world that we see. And people who are skeptical of Everett generally get off the bus at one of those steps along the way. Probably that's something we can talk about. Yeah, we'll probably get to that later, and especially uh, talking about probability in, in Everett, that's one of the uh, most controversial parts. Um, but I wanted to uh, maybe chase up something else, which is just the, um, okay, so, so there, there's so there's a question here that uh, we started off by talking about the single particle and electron in an atom and how it behaves like a wave. And when we bring entanglement into the picture and you don't have a wave, uh, you don't have a wave in physical space anymore. As you said, there's only a wave function for the two particles. So, I, you know, I think it's important to emphasize that, um, you know, when you're, when you're doing the Everettian approach to quantum mechanics, it's not, it's not, you're not just saying that things are waves the whole time. You're saying that it's this weird multi-dimensional object that doesn't, uh, doesn't fit into ordinary three-dimensional space is, is what's, what the reality is. Um, yeah, no, sorry. I just let me just agree that you're hundred percent correct. And I, I, I personally take take this as a feature rather than a bug, but it is one of those things that makes you say, well, wait a minute, you're asking a lot. <laughs> you're you're starting from very simple principles, but uh, they're so different from our usual way of describing the world that I have a right to be conservative and, and ask, you know, do I need to deviate from my experience in quite such a dramatic way? 
So, and there, there is also another sort of objection which comes up um, from that point of view, because there is, you know, another place where we have um, these uh, multidimensional type of functions, and that's just in, in ordinary probability theory. So if I have, for example, um, two coins, and I want, uh, you know, that they're, they're both either on heads or tails, and I want to know um, what's the probability of every possible configuration, well, that's a function of the configurations of both particles. I have to specify a probability for heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, and, tail, head, and, and tails, tails. Um, and so a lot of people have um, an intuition, like some of the anti-Everettians, myself included, that um, what the wave function is, is something more like that, right? It's not mm -hmm. something that describes the actual physical state of the world, but something that describes our uncertainty about the state of the world. And uh, that has, you know, at least there's, there's many things you can say about that point of view, but it has um, the advantages that it, it explains why the, why the thing should be this multidimensional object. And also it explains why when you measure it, it should change, right? So if I don't know whether a coin is heads or tails, I assign it 50-50 probability, and then I look and see it's heads, then I immediately change my probability to be 100% heads. So um, I think something here needs to be said about why you think that kind of point of view um, isn't viable. Well, let me, uh, there's sort of two things I'm tempted to say. One is to sort of list the various respectable alternatives to Everett, because they certainly do exist. And, and you just mentioned one of them. And I could do that. Or I could just, uh, we could just instantly dive into the debate about why I, I am a, a realist and an Everettian versus a, an epistemic person. Which do you prefer? Well, I mean, I, I don't think that the question is about being a realist or not, because you could perfectly well... About the wave function. You could be, right. you could perfectly well be a realist about something that isn't the wave function. Okay. So, yeah, I, I meant realism about the wave. The so wave function realism. Yeah. So let let's let's talk about why why you believe in wave function realism. Good. So um, the the I actually have you know over the course of how I've uh, changed my presentation in various ways about uh, when I give talks and and write books on quantum mechanics. I think that it's actually critically important to highlight this question because people instantly jump to what they call the measurement problem, right? Like what happens when you make a measurement? Uh, you know, how quickly does it happen? What needs to be the measuring apparatus, et cetera? And it's a, that's a perfectly good problem, but hidden beneath the surface and it doesn't get as much, it doesn't get called out and labeled as much as what you can call the reality problem. Like what is the real world in your theory, okay? So there are theories, including Everett, but there are also other theories in which the wave function, which is part of everyone's theory, okay? Uh, there's, so if, if the wave function is part of everyone's theory, there's roughly speaking three choices. One is, it's the only part, it's the reality, it maps onto reality exactly. That's what Everett says in some other uh, points of view. One is, well, it's part of reality, but there are other parts also. There's other particles or something like that. That's what Einstein and Schrodinger were sympathetic to and modern day Bohmians uh, had the same idea. And then the third is, well, there's reality, but it's not the wave function. <laughs> the wave function has nothing to do with reality. Uh, the wave function is a tool we use to make predictions for observational outcomes. Um, so, you know, I think that there's, if you wanna know why I favor the Everettian Point of view on this particular issue, um, I think there's two reasons. One is I think it works. I think it's you know, a very, very simple theory that fits the data and helps move us forward when we tackle other fundamental issues like quantum gravity and space-time, which I talk about in my book. Um, and then the other, I, I, I'm not sure what the alternative is. If you think that the, the, not the alternative for what reality is. So if you want to take the wave function as a, a tool to calculate the probabilities of measurement outcomes, I'm going to say, well, okay, but what is reality then? Like, what is the ontology of the world? And I think I, you get different answers to asking different people because physicists disagree, right? But um, some people, uh, I, I think the best answer, the, the answer I like the most from people I disagree with is, I'm sure it's there, but we don't know yet. That's a perfectly fair answer, right? Like, you know, we're working on that, you know, get back to us. That's always a perfectly good answer in physical theories. There's, there's other people who start getting a little mystical when you start talking about uh, what reality is. And there are other people who say, no, I don't care. There's no such thing as reality. All I'm gonna do is predict the outcomes of observations. But any one of those three options seems to me, you know, 
possible, but, you know, very tentative and, and not very um, actionable in terms of what I want to do as a theoretical physicist, understanding space time and whatever. If you tell me reality is isomorphic to a vector in Hilbert space, which is a fancy mathematical term for the wave function, then I know what to do in terms of research program. Like, you know, okay, can space time emerge from that? Can quantum field theory emerge from that? Uh, should space time be curved? What role does entanglement play? Uh, whereas if you say, call me back later, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to figure that out, then I'm not quite sure what to do. So until someone convinces me that Everett can't work, uh, and I don't yet know exactly what Everett, uh, how, I, I am very quick to admit that I don't yet know the full story for connecting Everett to the real world. I'm going to work on that. Okay, sure. So um, and some of these things we'll get into a bit later. I mean, my my opinion on all the quantum interpretations yeah, that exist. Here. There's, a, there's a question in the chat, which I think I'll pass along to Sean. Uh, right. Someone wants to know if you can elucidate some of the differences between your version of many worlds and the version um, specified by Wallace in his recent books. Um, There's almost good. no difference. Yeah, no, David Wallace is a well-known philosopher of physics. Like many philosophers of physics, he uh, actually got his PhD in physics and then got his job in a philosophy department. He's probably the leading person uh, thinking about the Everett, interpret of quantum, Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. Uh, at a technical level today. Uh, I encourage everyone to go buy his book called The Emergent Multiverse, if you want some of the details. I think that as physical theories, David's version of Everett, and I think Kai, we're seeing your, I'm seeing your image, not mine. I don't know if that matters to you. Um, his, we're the, it's the same theory. It's Everettian quantum mechanics. We, de we deviate in details a little bit about how to map on to reality and so forth. Uh, the big divergence of discussion is that we have different favorite ways of deriving the Born rule. Like the big issue, the big challenge in Everettian quantum mechanics, as Matt already alluded to, is it's a deterministic theory. There's no probabilities in this theory everywhere, anywhere. How are you going to derive the fact that as a matter of empirical uh, reality, when I measure things, they, they follow a probability distribution given by the wave function squared, right? This is a very legitimate worry about Everettian quantum mechanics. David and I have different ways of answering it, but we both like each other's ways. We just think that ours is the best, um, and they get the same answer. So it's, you know, it, it's, a, it's definitely a matter of friendly uh, cooperation rather than rivalry. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks for the question, by the way. People have interesting questions. Uh, please feel free to chip in. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, from what, what you said, one thing I strongly agree with you on is that, you know, the way that we're going to find the solutions to these questions is by trying to push these theories beyond the limits of, of standard quantum mechanics, right? So if all interpretations of quantum mechanics agree on all of the experiments that we've all already done and all the things that we agree will happen, it's by trying to push these ideas into new realms trying to derive emergent space time and things like that, that we will possibly be able to differentiate these ideas. So even if I'm not an Everettian myself, I certainly appreciate the effort of uh, trying to push the Everettian ideas in that sort of direction. Um, let's see, I think uh, let's, maybe we should move on to talking about probabilities in Everett. Sure. Um, so on Monday, when we had a, a meeting of the directors of the, of the Institute for Quantum Studies, I asked um, Jeff Tollickson what uh, Yakir Aronhoff, who's our, who's our director, would ask you. If, uh, if he <laughs> and uh, he said, he always, when people bring up Everett, he always talks about the quantum suicide uh, paradox. Right. Um, so he would ask about that. So on his behalf, <laughs> I want to ask you to, to maybe explain, explain what that is and, and why you don't think it's a problem. So the quantum suicide idea, I'm not sure it's a paradox, but it's, it's, it's an idea. And I'm, I'm not actually sure who the first to propose it was, but I know that Max Tegmark uh, wrote about it and sort of popularized it. And the idea is the following. So if you believe, let, let's simplify our lives. And rather than looking at the direction in which an electron is moving, let's just measure its spin. And the nice thing about that is there's only two possible answers. It's spin up or spin down, spin clockwise or counterclockwise around some axis, okay? And so what you can do is say, like, let's hook up an apparatus that will measure the spin of an electron. We'll arrange it so that it's 50-50 in the usual way of thinking about things. 
Um, and if it's spin up, nothing happens. But if you get spin down, you instantly die. You, you imagine you're able to kill yourself so quickly that you don't know you were going to be killed. You not, don't feel any pain. It's just completely painless, okay? Now, if it were truly uh, the 50-50 randomness were truly just sort of unpredictable stochastic event, this seems like a bad way to spend your time because as you did it more and more often, the chances that you survive many such trials uh, are one half and then one quarter and then one eighth and they get smaller and smaller over time. If you're an Everettian, you think that, well, there's always one branch or one history of branches throughout, throughout time on which you survive fine, right? There are other branches on which you die, but on those, you're dead, so you don't know that you're dead, right? You're, we're imagining here that we're materialists about physical beings and their soul does not survive to, to be mad or anything like that. So you say, look, if you conditionalize on those branches where I'm alive and have feelings about what just happened, my feelings are always quite positive, <laughs> right? I'm alive and nothing, nothing strange happened. Now, ever, uh, sorry, uh, Tegmark, when he wrote about this, his point of view was not Therefore, this is a fun experiment to do. There's nothing against it. His point of view was simply, if you did this experiment and you found yourself alive, the person who found themselves alive would have a good reason to believe in the Everett interpretation because there's a 100% chance that some such person exists if Everett is right, but not in any other interpretation. Um, but other people have taken it you know, to, to more extremes. Why wouldn't I do that? So my answer to that is, is twofold. Um, the most important thing is if you so if you just do branching and you know measure the spins of electrons without killing anybody, it's crucially important to my way of thinking about Everett that after the branching happens, there are now two separate people. They came from the same you, but there's no longer any connection. I mean, that's why they can be considered to be separate worlds. There's a person on the spin up branch who descended from you, and a person on the spin down branch who descended from you. So it's not like part of you is dying or part of this extended multi-part person is dying. A person is dying and another person is not. Two separate people, okay? And the fact that the person who dies won't be around to feel sad about it, well, that's something you could have said in classical mechanics, right? In classical or any, any theory with just one world. If someone says, well, you know, if I have a machine that will kill you instantly whenever I choose to do so, and it'll be painless to you and you won't know anything about it, would you mind me probably or possibly using it? And you would say, yes, I do mind you using that. I don't want to die. And they say, yes, but don't worry. You won't feel it. And once you're dead, there'll be no one around to really uh, feel bad about it. And my point is, I am bothered now by the prospect that you might kill me someday in the future for no good reason. And that's how human beings just exist. Like otherwise, by the same logic, you say if someone snaps their fingers and the universe disappears, it's not a bad thing because there's no one around to feel bad about it. I think that we can feel bad about things that haven't yet happened. And in this quantum suicide experiment, there's a whole bunch of people who are committing suicide and I can feel bad about that. So I'm not in favor of this experiment. Okay. I mean, I think this, this sort of begins to bring up some of the issues which concern probability because it's, it's all about, uh, you know, classically when we think about probability and uncertainty, we think that um, one thing is definitely going to happen and uh, the probabilities enter because we're currently unsure which, which of those possibilities is gonna happen. Um, so you're, we're talking about shifting to, from that point of view to the point of view where um, all, all the outcomes will happen in some universe. Um, now, I mean, regardless of, of um, quantum suicide, I think this does challenge our moral, uh, does challenge our moral intuition somewhat. So, you know, people often make an analogy similar to what you were alluding to, where, you know, imagine um, we lived in a classical universe with a cloning machine, and you right. went into the cloning machine, it made two copies of you, and then, and then killed the original, right? So those two clones um, have equal right to think of themselves as your successor. And if you think about an experiment where, um, one of those, you know for sure that one of those clones is definitely going to die and the other one isn't. Um, and you have a choice whether to enter into the action that will cause that to happen or not. Right? You, can, you can just ignore the cloning machine. Like maybe 
the one who's, who survives gets a uh, billion dollars, right? So it has a very good outcome, right. but the other one's definitely going to die. Um, so, you know, you have a choice about whether to enter, engage in that or not. Um, now, um, so the quantum suicide logic would say you should because you're going to get a billion dollars. But on other logic, it's, you would say, well, somebody's definitely going to die, right? And yeah. you don't like death. <laughs> you don't like people dying, so I shouldn't do it. And, and so to make the, the analogy even, even uh, better in some ways, some people like make the analogy, well, suppose instead of talking about two clones of you, you imagine that you had two kids, right? You have two kids and you're going to engage in, an, you're going to do an act which is going to cause one of them to be a billionaire and the other one to die. And you ask parents, would you do that? Uh, the answer is almost certainly no. Now, if, if ever it is true, every time there's sort of some, some quantum branching, both branches occur, which means that, you know, even in very sort of mundane activities, if there's a very, very small chance that you would die from it, then one copy of you dies. So you can talk about every time you sort of get out of bed in the morning and cross the road, you are in principle killing uh, copies of you. So in, in, according to the classical logic, it's like, well, it's just there's a very, very small chance that I'm going to die. There's one of me, and I feel like I can take that risk. But if, if something like Everett is true, then every single time you cross the road, somebody dies in some branch of the, of the wave function. And so there's a moral argument that you could make that if, you know, if I value human life, if that's what I value as, as a virtue, then I should just stay wrapped up in bed every single day and never do anything. And so this is kind of like the opposite of the, of the quantum suicide logic, but can you sort of argue against why that isn't uh, the correct, morally correct thing to do? Yeah, I think, um, let me say a couple of preliminary things, then I'll actually answer the question. You know, I, I got, um, there's a great example that I heard when I was interviewing Martin Rees, a uh, famous astrophysicist for the podcast, for the Mindscape podcast. Um, because he did work on existential risks to humanity. And one of them was, of course, a large hadron collider turning on and creating a black hole or a phase transition and destroying the universe. And people were very worried about that. And the argument was, well, sure, it's unlikely. But if literally the outcome is destroying all of humanity, I mean, how unlikely does it have to be? Really, 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 really unlikely. In fact, maybe even just don't do it just to be safe, right? Even if it's pretty darn unlikely. Um, and Reese's answer was, well, look, it's also possible, it is, as, as a good scientist, he can't say that the Large Hadron Collider would not, with absolute metaphysical certainty, not destroy the human race. But it's also possible that something we discover, the Large Hadron Collider, will give free pollution-free energy for humanity for the next billion years. It's not very likely, <laughs> but it's possible. And the point is that for any of the really, really unlikely things you can think of that would be bad, there's also really, really unlikely things you can think of that would be good. And the, the moral of that story is that maybe you're not actually being very rational if you're focusing your attention on these crazy tales of the distribution, okay? You should actually think about what is most likely most of the time. And then the second part of the argument is that the what we think of as probability in Everett is really in every way, just as if we lived in a truly stochastic chancy world where these really were probabilities. It is different metaphysically. And again, I, my, my for, sort of favorite anti Everett argument is that Everett is so different metaphysically that I should just be too bothered by it and, and try very hard to make it not true. Um, but if Everett works at all, I think that it, it absolutely either, it can go either way, either Everett implies the following thing or you better believe the following thing in order to be an Everettian. And the following thing is the weight that you put on different branches for any consideration of interest, whether it's the probability of living in that branch or the moral um, utility that you assign to it is proportional to the wave function squared. Uh, it, that it has to be, otherwise, you know, nothing works in Everettian quantum mechanics. And so I think that even if you were to utilitarian, which I am not, the right way to think about, you know, going forward in the world is to be a utilitarian where you weight the utility of different things by the wave function squared. And so 
if I have two people in front of me and I say, well, I'm going to give one a billion dollars and I'm going to kill the other one with this gun. And you're a utilitarian. You think I should do that? <laughs> Most utilitarians would say, no, don't do that because the value of a life is even worth more than a billion dollars. Economists might demur from that, but most most people would say, don't do that. Right. And I think that the Everettian says the same thing. Okay. Um, maybe we can get... Uh, I can jump in with. Yeah, sure. So um, we've got one question about how many, many worlds we're talking about per second or per cubic meter in the universe. Uh, so if you want to try and give an answer for that. Um, and if, after you do, I have one more question I can pose to you. Sure. Well, the, this, the quick answer is there's no such thing as per cubic meter because the, the worlds do not exist anywhere. The worlds exist parallel to each other in some abstract mathematical space. They're not located anywhere. When I measure the spin of an electron, now there are two universes. They both exist. You can't ask where they are. Okay. Um, as to how many of them there are, Sadly, we don't know, and, and we don't even know what, what the possible answers are. There's, a, there's one idea that it's a very, very large, but still finite number. And we don't know what that number is. We, we throw around numbers like 10 to the power, 10 to the power 120. That's the number of possible worlds that there could be. We have fewer now, but we're getting there as time goes on. But there's another perfectly good possibility that the number is infinite, that it's just a smooth continuum of possibilities. And that sounds like a little bit of a cop-out, but it's very, very common in theories in physics that you know the number of points between here and here in classical physics is infinite, you know, but we don't that doesn't bother us. We we just say don't talk about how many points there are, talk about the relative number of points between this interval and that interval. And that's something we can talk about perfectly well in Everettian quantum mechanics. So most Everettians don't dwell on the question of how many worlds there are other than to say, to the extent that we can even answer that question, the answer is a lot of worlds. All right, so uh, the other question was somewhat related. Uh, it's about the difference between the notions of divergence and splitting uh, in many worlds. And these words get used a couple of different ways. So what, what, the, what the question is referring to is um, divergence, sort of the notion that uh, we have a bunch of separate, almost identical copies of things already. And uh, the splitting would be more like uh, the fission, like an amoeba dividing into two new amoebas. So before there was one and afterwards there are two. So what can, what can you say about uh, your opinion about that uh, sort of distinction in many worlds theories? Um, my attitude towards those differences is um, it's a free country. You can divide up the wave function of the universe however you like. Uh, and this sounds a little cheeky, but it's a crucial feature of Everettian quantum mechanics that the worlds that we talk about um, are emergent. They're approximations that help us understand the world and talk about it in convenient ways at the macroscopic level. If you were God, or if you were Laplace's demon, if you were an infinitely knowledgeable being, and you just knew the wave function of the universe, you would never have to talk about worlds at all. Um, the choice to divide the wave function of the universe up into worlds is one that maps onto true object, objective physical properties of the wave function. The, some divisions work and some don't, but nevertheless, there is some, also some freedom in doing that. So this idea that you should think of the pre-splitting wave function as many, many copies, but they're all exactly identical, and what they do is just differentiate from each other going forward, versus you should think of one big universe that actually divides in two, um, it doesn't matter to me. I generally think of it in the latter way, one big universe that divides in two, but it doesn't bother me if you really would rather think of it in other ways. Okay, um, thanks, for, thanks for those questions. Um, I don't wanna dwell on probability and Everett for the entire rest of the time we've got. Um, although I think we could talk about that for, for a good hour by itself. <laughs> I mean, so there are questions as to um, whether the notion of probability is even coherent, even makes sense in that theory. And, and there are questions about whether, as you alluded to, um, the derivations that attempt to show that probability should be the square of the uh, amplitude of the branch of the wave function, whether those work. So, you know, I think maybe we'll table those discussions for, for another time because they're very interesting. Uh, foundations of probability is another one of my sort of pet interests. But I want to sort of, 
push back on this idea as well, and maybe go back and push back on this idea of let's suppose um, that everybody agreed that all of the potential problems with Everett were resolved. So let's suppose everybody agreed that, for instance, the probability problem had a satisfactory answer. Um, the question is, should everybody be an Everettian then? So I, I sort of tend to think that even some of the anti-Everettians around um, do have that opinion that the, you know, the only reason I don't like Everett is because it doesn't actually work, right? Uh, but if it worked perfectly fine, I would suddenly be an Everettian because it's obviously the simplest uh, solution to all of these problems. I want to push back on that a little bit because like to my mind, you know, I'm not, I'm not an anti-Everettian. I just think that the correct answer to the interpretation question is none of the above in the sense of all the interpretations we have right now. But I, I just think that we're in a very uh, weird position in the interpretation of quantum mechanics. So normally when we build a physical theory, uh, at least prior to quantum mechanics, almost all, well, fundamental physical theories were built in the following way. You started out with an idea of what the theory was about. So you started out, you know, Newtonian mechanics, for instance, with the idea there are particles, they have trajectories in space, right? And then on top of that, on top of that idea of the ontology of the reality, you build the mathematical formulas and the rules for how these things behave. So there is from the outset an idea of what the theory is about and sort of therefore these sort of kinds of questions don't come up. Whereas in, in quantum mechanics, what happened was that various people in the early days had some coherent ideas about what reality was like. Unfortunately, they were very different from each other and incompatible. And uh, for very good reasons, we ended up with this mathematical formalism, but uh, the mathematic, we have a very sophisticated mathematical formalism, an elegant, beautiful mathematical formalism. However, we have no idea what it says about reality. So this is a very unusual situation for physicists to be in. And I just wonder, um, are we very good at taking a complicated mathematical formalism and backing out the reality it's supposed to describe. So, so it's sort of a question I sometimes ask is, you know, sometimes ask myself is, let's imagine we were in the same situation um, with classical mechanics. How good of a job we would do? Would we do? So here's, you know, here's a here's a sort of hypothetical to uh, try and try and uh, pump your intuition a bit. You know, suppose we have a a billiard table. The billiard table has some collection of balls of different colors and different uh, positions. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have direct access to the billiard table. There's somebody's put a cover on it, right? An opaque cover. Um, it's high enough that the balls can still move around. So perhaps maybe the balls are magnetic and we have some, some weak magnets that we can use to sort of roughly prepare the system in a, in a given state. And also there are some holes in the cover on the sides, uh, a few holes, and we can stick a billiard cue into, into one of those holes and uh, change the angle and we can choose how hard to push the billiard cue through the hole. Okay, um, and what we're interested in doing is uh, predicting which balls are gonna fall into which pockets with what probabilities, right? Um, now, suppose somebody gives you the mathematical formalism of classical mechanics in order to, you don't have any idea what's going on underneath the cover, but somebody gives you the mathematical formalism of classical mechanics. They don't, however, give it to you in the sort of straightforward introductory way that we teach it to first year physics students, but they give you, you know, one of the more advanced mathematical formalism. So you know, not, not everybody listening to this will be aware, but, now, almost every physical theory has a variety of different ways of writing it down mathematically. And classical mechanics, you know, you can write down Newton's three laws, which probably most people uh, have encountered at some point, but there are also things called Hamiltonian mechanics, Lagrangian mechanics, Uville mechanics, the hamilton jacobi theory, which employ very different mathematical objects and techniques, but in the end of the day lead to the same, same predictions. So uh, what I want you to imagine is somebody gives you uh, one of the mo more sophisticated formalisms, one that's not so straightforward to understand what it means, and also some rules for given, you know, the states that exist in those formalisms, you know, coarse grain them in such a way that enables you to predict the probabilities of the 
balls falling into the various pockets. Right? Those rules might look quite kind of complicated and ad hoc. Now, if you were given that mess and you were asked, uh, which parts of this formalism refer to reality? Um, do you think you, or in general, the physics community would go do a good job of that? So my intuition when I think about that is definitely not. We'd be having, <laughs> we'd be having long debates about it for, for, you know, for a century, like with quantum mechanics. Um, so I don't know, what do you think about that, that kind of scenario? Do you think that if we were in the same situation in classical mechanics, we'd make the right choices? Well, I think that um, there's sort of two, two ways of thinking about that. Um, maybe I'm not completely understanding the thought experiment, but let me, let me think of it in two different ways. If someone just handed me the rules of Everettian quantum mechanics, and I didn't know anything about the world, uh, the actual world of our experience, would I be able to invent, oh, there's a classical limit and there are branches and these observers see these things. Uh, it, even in my most proud moments, I think, no, I would not actually invent that, those, that stuff from uh, just the bare bones formalism. But the other extreme is that we have a lot of information about the real world. You know, we know that there is space time. We know it's dynamical. We know there are fields in it. We know that they act locally. We know that they... Uh, we didn't even know they're Lagrangian and that we have a Lagrangian that fits all the data we've ever uh, explored in any experimental result, any experiment we've ever done in human history. So um, the actual task we're faced with is taking this formalism that seems very, very abstract um, and not at all intuitive, but we're, we're mapping it to a very, very rich collection of phenomena that we know a lot about and that are actually constrained by symmetries and conservation laws and all these interesting things. And so I think that it is a hard problem to go from this abstract formalism to the messy reality of our world, but I don't think it's intractable. I mean, I think that for whatever reason, People haven't done it. <laughs> Even, you know, since the 1950s, we could have started, you know, after Everett suggested the idea. But again, since, you know, uh, fundamental physics has been working on other things and probably for good reason for a long while, uh, that's not the effort that has actually been undertaken. So for me and my friends and my graduate students, this is great because that means that there's a lot of low hanging fruit, easy questions that have never been answered before we get to the hard ones and we can still make interesting amounts of progress on them. And what I, what I think is amazing is that progress is, is quite manifest. Like you can see the progress being made. Um, so yeah, uh, in, the, in that real world version of the example, I'm actually quite optimistic that we will go from this very, very abstract formalism to the real world. Plenty of roadblocks along the way. And one of them, of course, is that the abstract formalism might be wrong and we might you know, find a, a, a reason why it fails. And final thought, you know, to go to where you started here, if we did all agree that ever worked, as a theory, that it fit the data, right? Um, I still don't think that everyone should, I mean, maybe everyone should put most of their credence onto Everetti and quantum mechanics, but I certainly wouldn't think that everyone should stop thinking about alternatives to Everetti and quantum mechanics. I mean, right now in my, my cosmology brethren, there's a lot of people working on alternatives to Einstein's general theory of relativity, not because there's any interpretational problem with it or because there's any conflict with the data, but just because, you know, maybe it's wrong. And also there are other things we don't understand. Maybe modifying gravity will help us understand them in some way. So I think that even if we thought that Everett, uh, it was a clear path from uh, the Everettian formalism to the world that we see, that doesn't mean it's the right path. And that doesn't mean we should stop thinking about alternatives. So I, I want to push on this to, just a little bit further because I mean, what I'm trying to drive at is, um, you know, so one of the arguments in favor of Everett is, is this sort of minimalism argument. It's like, let's just take the physics at, the fa at face value and let it tell, you know, you try to be as minimalist about it as possible. Um, so I'm kind of a bit skeptical of, of that claim, right? Uh, because um, Everett seems sort of very Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation centric, if, if you like. You take the particular formalism that you have of quantum mechanics, which is of this um, vector in, in Hilbert space, uh, evolving in time according to this equation of motion. There are other formalisms of quantum mechanics, which 
for example, place more focus on the observables or use com mathematic, completely mathematically different objects entirely. And if you were to say, well, I want to be minimalist, um, it's not clear what, your, what the first thing you should say is about what that means is real. So for example, if you, if you really think like the Heisenberg picture, for instance, which takes the structure of quantum observables to be the fundamental thing, what the, the, the things that we can measure takes it, those as the fundamental thing, then those have a structure and you could say, well, the structure of those things is what's representing fundamental reality. And then that would lead you to a picture, you know, I sometimes say that, you know, although it's currently extremely out of favor, um, the old quantum logic interpretations, which say, which said, let's take that structure uh, immediately at face value, um, have equal claim to be minimalist in my, in my view. Um, and so, you know, the point of the analogy with the billiard table is just that it's, it's very easy to imagine that, for example, if the equations you were given were those of Lagrangian mechanics, Lagrangian mechanics involves specifying the position of a particle at an initial time and at a final time, and then you sort of work out uh, the whole the trajectory over time as a whole, like in, in one block, rather than taking it time step by time step. So, you know, I could very well easily imagine somebody given that saying, well, it's clear that there's some kind of teleology teleology in this physics, it's clear that there's some kind of backwards influence of future conditions, because that's the way the equations are structured, that's what the equations tell me, and I'm going to take that as base value. So I just think that it's hard to look at the set of, uh, a formalism, you know, where, where we didn't start with a notion of what the ontology was is to begin with. It's, it's hard to take, um, to take the equations of physics and say, I'm taking this as face value, and have that lead to sort of one unique point of view. I think that there are sort of multiple points of view which could probably claim to be as minimalist as, as ever it is. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, it's a very good point. And um, as a tiny little footnote, it's very interesting that literally uh, last week I got an email from um, a physicist, I think at Oxford, who's written a paper with David Deutsch that does the ever interpretation in the Heisenberg picture, just to show that it can be done. And But it, you're certainly completely correct that there are different ways of casting any one physical theory. And depending on the way you do it, the physical theory might look very uh, simple and elegant and powerful, or might, might look like an ungodly mess. Like if you have a relativistic quantum field theory, which are the theories that are the favorites among uh, field theorists right now, for those of you out there in the audience, there's a certain kind of theory we all know and love. Uh, there's a certain way of writing down those theories called the Lagrangian formalism that makes them very look very pretty and, and wonderful. And there's another way you could write them down called the Hamiltonian formalism in which they would all look like ungodly messes, right? I mean, Einstein's theory of general relativity is extremely beautiful in a certain notation. And there's other ways of writing notation in which it looks extremely ugly. So to me, you know, the claim that ever it is minimalist is not it's minimalist among all possible theories you could imagine inventing. Uh, it's minimalist among theories we've invented, which is a much smaller set, right? If someone else comes up with another theory that is equally minimalist and does just as good a job in answering both the measurement problem and the reality problem and fits the data just as well, then I think that would be a tremendous accomplishment. I'd be all for it. But again, you know, I mean, this is for, for the people out there in the audience who are not professional physicists, um, sometimes physicists have to act more sure than they are, right? Like if you think that string theory has a 60% chance of being the right theory of quantum gravity, you might, you, you're not going to devote 60% of your research effort to doing string theory. You might very plausibly devote a hundred percent of your research effort to doing string theory. Cause you're like, well, I got to work on something. And the more I work on the same thing, the more expert I am and the more progress I will make. And so I'm going to work on the most likely thing. Uh, so to me, I don't spend a lot of my time in my professional capacity thinking about alternatives to the Everett interpretation of quantum mechanics. I think about how to take the Everett interpretation and map it onto the world. Um, other people, you know, they take the next step. They're like, I don't care about any interpretation. I'm going to think about what the Lagrangian is or whatever. And other people say, well, I don't even believe the interpretation. I'm going to try to invent alternatives. I like the fact that we have a rich ecosystem of different possibilities. You know, I. It, not only do I think that other people should work on alternatives to Everett, 
I think there should be more people than currently exist working on alternatives to Everett. And I also think there should be a lot more people working on Everett. But you know, you and I don't disagree about these particular uh, funding priorities. Sure. Um, since we're running close to an hour now, I don't want to quite finish yet because we haven't talked about uh, possibly the most, or certainly the most innovative aspect of what's talked to, uh, what you talk about in your book, which is sort of the idea of trying to derive um, space time from entanglement. Um, so, uh, I don't know, maybe you want to say for like a minute or so what, 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 uh, what that is about, and then we can discuss it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the um, program, if you want to, if you want to sort of dignify it with that kind of terminology that uh, my students and postdocs and I have been thinking about over the last five or 10 years, is really based on the idea that we should try to forget everything we know about how the real world is actually um, structured, at least temporarily, and then start with the bare bones of Everettian quantum mechanics and build everything back up. So almost nobody does this, even the most com com committed Everettians. What, what you do as a physicist, um, when you have a quantum mechanical theory, very often, not all the time, but very, very often, is you start with a classical theory, and then you promote it to a quantum mechanical theory. So you have a particle in a box, or you have a harmonic oscillator, or even you know the electron in the orbit of an atom. All these have classical descriptions. The entire standard model of particle physics have a, has a classical description, which you then quantize, okay? And that lets you leap over some difficult problems and get right to some interesting, you know, empirically accessible phenomena that you can talk about. But if you don't let yourself do that, if you do this sort of thought experiment we were talking about, all you have is a vector <laughs> and maybe an evolution equation for that vector as it changes over time. Why does that look like space time with all this stuff in it, okay? Um, you don't have a lot to work with. You have, you have a vector, you know, okay, what is, what is that? Well, one thing you can do is you can sort of imagine dividing the world into subsystems. My most recent paper with Ashmeet Singh was about how you take this vector and divide it up into subsystems. And then once you have subsystems, like we said, there's only one wave function for the whole universe, so they can be entangled with each other. So if you imagine there's a lot of little subsystems and they're all entangled with each other, you can invent new criteria that you just invented. Well, there's a billion different subsystems, but they all only interact with a few of their neighbors. So that's actually very rare and that really pinpoints a kind of structure. And then you know, you're off to the races and you're trying to build everything up um, from these very fundamental ingredients. And entanglement plays a crucial role here, which is kind of, you know, it's fun because entanglement is a crucial feature of quantum mechanics. And it's, it's fun to think that space time is in some sense knitted together from this fundamental quantum thing. But it's a little bit more than that. Like it, so far progress has been slow, but still I would say there's been almost more progress than we had a right to expect. You know, the map between this fundamental quantum entanglement picture and Einstein's general theory of relativity is actually kind of easier to make than I would have expected. That's not much evidence one way or the other, but it, it, it's, it's there. Um, let me just put it in the most basic way. If you think that the geometry of space, right, you know, the bending of space that Einstein predicts, well, if you think that that geometry of space is somehow set by the amount of entanglement between different parts of the wave function, then of course the geometry of space is something that's dynamical and can change over time, right? I mean, of course space time should be curved. Why shouldn't it be? Entanglement can change very easily. And then, you know, the easiest way for it to be curved is just Einstein's general theory of relativity in, in some sense. So, None of this is very solid, you know, none of this is um, anything I would uh, ask anyone else to buy into quite yet, but I think as, as sort of vague ideas that are promising in terms of future prospects, I think this is really, really exciting right now. And I also think that, you know, despite you saying it's, it's a minority position, the idea of trying to get some kind of uh, picture of space time from entanglement or correlations is there's a variety of people doing that from different kinds of approaches at the moment. Um, well, sorry, let me, let me just mention very quickly for just to, just to clarify that one. Um, in modern quantum gravity, where people think about black holes and the information loss problem, and there's this famous example thought experiment that came from string theory called ADS CFT that I won't go into, but it all, all of these different examples focus in on conditions where gravity and the curvature of space-time is hugely important, right? Unmistakable. You're near a black hole, you're spread out over the universe. And what they find is that 
there's certain subtle ways in which the fundamental feature of quantum field theory, namely that interactions are local, things only bump into each other if they're right next to each other, seems to break down. And so when th th there's a lot of work being done right now on connecting entanglement with the structure of space-time, but it's not entanglement within space-time. It's the entanglement of something else that is giving rise in some weird holographic non-local way to space-time. Yeah. Whereas our approach, just because I don't want to do the same thing everyone else is doing, not because of any principled intellectual reason, is to say, you know, I would like to understand not what happens at the event horizon of a black hole, but why apples fall from trees. Right. What, why there's gravity in the weak field, you know, limit right here in the, in the vicinity of the earth, where you can presumably think about different parts of space time as having some location in space and being entangled with each other. So even though both kind of research programs are geometry arising from entanglement, they're, they're kind of non-overlapping given the current state of the art. Yeah, so I mean, I just want to, I guess, uh, comment on the fact that uh, this whole approach does see, although, you know, you might think, well, do I necessarily have to be an Everettian to, to, to buy this approach? I think that there are certain things in the interpretation of quantum mechanics that's heavily dependent on. And I think that's the reason why I'm fairly skeptical of it, but it has to do with, with these ki kinds of things. So, um, if you think about it, like if you're a wave function realist, then how do you have to think about entanglement? Then? Like entanglement is some like real physical thing, right? I, 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 I sometimes struggle to wonder, wonder how wave function realists really think about entanglement. Do, do, they do they think that there's some kind of metaphysical elastic band connecting two particles that, you know, however much you stretch it never breaks. Um, it's like that, uh, or something like that. But uh, sort of in this approach we were talking about earlier, where you think of the wave function as more an information um, type of device or something more like a probability, um, it's just correlation, right? It's just it's just a type of correlation, and correlation is like extremely commonplace. So in the program you're alluding to, you're really, uh, you know, you're trying to have space time emerge from the entanglement structure of some uh, things that are not spacey or timey to begin with. They're just right. quantum degrees of freedom. And I always sort of, I have this feeling or at least intuition that the thing that space time emerges from, whatever it is, it doesn't need to be space time itself, but it needs to you know, have some kind of substance. It needs to you know, be spacey <laughs> needs, to, needs to have some kind of spatial or temporal or causal properties to it. Whereas, you know, correlation, if I think of entanglement as being somehow like classical correlation, that just seems to have sort of no, it seems to be something extremely insubstantial. So it seems to me that, you know, we have good explanations for why uh, things that are closer together, you know, even in classical physics, things that are closer together are going to be more correlated, you know, so if you imagine a bunch of little magnets and they're in some random sort of weak background magnetic field, well, the magnets that are closer together are gonna to be more likely to line, be lined up in the same direction than those that are far apart. And, you know, you can even derive a law that says, okay, well, I can determine the distance between any two magnets by looking at how correlated they are. So it seems to me that the, so the conventional explanation would go from the spatial structure to explaining that correlation um, as opposed to, to, to the other way around. It would, it would explain why those two things are correlated, spatial distance and amount of correlation, but it wouldn't identify the one with the other, right? So there's a question of whether it's a good idea to identify the sort of entanglement structure with the space-time structure itself, or whether to just say, well, they're they're correlated, they're obviously correlated, and they're correlated because of some causal explanation that makes uh, one thing cause the other. And I think that sort of the conventional, the conventional picture in physics would be it's the latter. Um, so if, you, if you're really thinking of entanglement as a kind of insubstantial thing, this, this program doesn't seem to be like, it doesn't make a lot of intuitive sense, at least. 
Um, yeah, and you know, again, this is um, the proof of the pudding will be in the tasting. Uh, I think that the the contrary intuition is perfectly respectable, even if it's not my intuition. And you know, there's no question that the way that people come down on issues in the foundations of quantum mechanics will not only affect what kind of questions they work in, but what kind of progress they're likely to make, right? Like new insights into information theory or probability theory are much more likely to come from people who think of the wave function epistemically than Everettians. Everettians are like, what do you want? I square it and I get the probability. Let me move on with my life. But new insights in the nature of space-time, I think, are more likely to come from Everettians who think of the wave function as a thing that you know is, is the stuff out of which everything else is made of one way or the other, someone's right, someone's wrong, or there's some synthesis. But, you know, this is all so bleeding edge, cutting edge research that uh, I, I'm, I'm happy that different people are, are trying different avenues. Yeah. I, mean, I just wanted to push back on it a little bit. I mean, I do, you know, genuinely think that the people that are trying to push these foundational ideas into new, new areas of physics, that's where the progress is going to come from. Um, we are 10 past six now, so I do want to open it up to, to questions from the audience. Uh, I want to thanks, thank you. For, I know we could talk for, for hours. I have many more questions and things. <laughs> about. Um, but let's uh, let the audience ask some questions. Uh, uh, but before we do that, I want to give the, so while uh, Kai is getting prepared with the, the questions, please put your questions in the chat room. I do want to give you the details of the book giveaway, how we're going to do that. Um, so I'm going to try and do a, a screen share here, if I can manage it. Um, so there is a URL. I uh, hope everybody can see that. Is that appearing on the live stream, Kai? Uh, I won't know for 10 seconds. <laughs> okay. um, uh, live is in quotes here. <laughs> if you can see that, there is a, a URL up there. It's just uh, rebrand.ly forward slash give me a book. No yeah, space, yeah. give me a book. Oh, there it is, right. Uh, there's also a QR code and I'm gonna keep that up for, for a minute or two in case anybody wants to scan their computer screen with, the, with their phone. Um, if you go there, um, it just asks for your name and address, a mailing address. It also does ask if you want to sign up to receive information about future IQS events, but you can say no if you don't wish to. And I'm going to keep that survey open for the next 24 hours. At the end of that, I have 20 copies of the book. At the end of that, I will randomly choose 20 people to send out uh, the books to. Uh, it is US and Canada only. Um, unfortunately, you know we have limits on how much postage we can afford. So uh, only for people with a mailing address in, in US or and Canada. So uh, please sign up there and you'll have a chance of winning the book. And I do uh, recommend it, even though, as is apparent, I disagree with Sean on a lot of things. I think this is an excellent account, in particular, the best popular account of the Everett point of view that you can find um, in the popular science literature at the moment. Um, so with that, uh, Kai, do we have some questions from the audience? We have many. Uh, they're a bit scattered through the chat, but I'm going to start um, with the the one that had to wait at the end of the conversation unfortunately let me just scroll back up and find uh exactly what she wanted me to ask all right so uh basically she wants to know sean's opinion on um are there reasons to believe there's a gap in our knowledge of the foundations of quantum mechanics um do we really need to you know are there really questions that we still need to answer or do we have a, a theory that's good enough as it is um uh, you know i believe the quote was it is what it is uh, no, I, I think that it's it's to me at least. Uh, I think I bet that Matt will agree with me on this. It's crystal clear that we don't yet have the theory that is good enough. Um, like I said, there are these problems. There are two problems: the reality problem and um, the measurement problem, which most people working in the foundations of quantum mechanics agree have not been solved. Now, let, let's let's back up and and admit that this depends on what you mean by solved. Um, cause I wrote it, I wrote actually a, uh, op-ed in the New York times when my book came out where I said, you know, I quoted Feynman saying, nobody understands quantum mechanics. We should work to understand quantum mechanics, et cetera. And a couple of my friends who are physicists did chime in and said, well, I understand quantum mechanics <laughs> fine. So what we mean when we say that is that, uh, there is no consensus about the answer to these questions. Even if Matt or I might not know the an might know the answers, we can't both know the answers because we think of different answers are being right, and we don't know which one of us is right. Okay, um, 
some per people might think that their favorite formulation is good enough for all the questions that we need to know the answers to. Um, I don't even think my own uh, formulation is good enough to say that because we've not yet completely finished or even come close to finishing this question of how to map it onto reality. I don't think that Matt's favorite interpretation is up to that task either uh, because this question of what reality is is still a little bit unclear. And I can say similar things about other interpretations. So uh, very, you know, I don't know what the right interpretation of quantum mechanics is, but with 99.9% .9 certainty, uh, I can say that we have not yet finished developing it. All right, uh, the next question is sort of a, a couple of different questions, which I'm gonna try to roll together. So Sean, in your version of Everett Many Worlds, is entropy conserved across all of the different worlds? And do you have some uh, worlds where you have entropy uh, starting high and becoming lower and other worlds where it's doing the reverse? Well, entropy is a tricky thing because there are different definitions of it, but in the, let's just go with a standard kind of intuitive uh, definition that we use to talk about the fact that ice cubes melt but don't unmelt. I think it's what you would expect. In almost all the worlds, in a well-defined measure, uh, entropy increases over time in the way that the second law of thermodynamics predicts. There will be uh, worlds in which entropy goes down. Uh, you, most of them, it will go down a little bit and then pop back up. Just like you can say in a more stochastic version of reality, there is a small but not zero probability that entropy will fluctuate downward rather than going up. And Boltzmann dealt with this in the 1870s, and I don't think the story has really changed. All Everett does is say that, yeah, there's going to be some worlds in which very, very, very unlikely things happen. But if you don't know which world you're in, it's very, very, very unlikely you're in one of those worlds. All right, um, I'm looking back through here first for other questions. So if anyone has questions, they've all kind of gotten lost in the in the chat here. So please just post them again in the bottom. It'll make it easier for me to find them. Um, but uh, there's all another natural question about time. If we go and look at uh, something more like Wheeler DeWitt, uh, why do we perceive that time changes at all? Uh, if there's only this change in amplitude. Um, you know, if everything is sort of all at once in a block form, why do we perceive a change? Yeah, this is a good question. And again, this is something where I don't think that the final answer is anywhere close to established. Um, is time emergent in the same sense that I think that space could be emergent? You know, they need not be on the same footing. Okay, that's one thing. Like a, a for foundational principle of Einstein's general theory of relativity is that time and space are on the same footing. But now we're trying to go beyond uh, Einstein into quantum gravity, and it may or may not remain true that time and space are on the same footing. Uh, in the most straightforward Everettian formulation of quantum mechanics, based on the Schrodinger equation, time and space are, uh, on the surface, very different things, right? So they might very well be different, and it might just be an emergent approximation to say that time and space are the same thing. But this question of whether or not we can get the experience of time passing out of a description which is fundamentally atemporal, uh, is one that you could have had in relativity. Forget about quantum mechanics, right? Um, in relativity, it's very natural to think of the whole four-dimensional universe at once. And then you say, well, if that's reality, why do I think I experience time passing? And it's a complicated answer that involves physics and also psychology and also philosophy, as well as thermodynamics and things like that, because individual versions of you at different times um, are related to the world around them in subtle but important ways, both the world to the past and the world to the future. Uh, they live in a world where there's a gradient of entropy increasing in one direction. They tend to anticipate the future just as they experience and remember the past. So individual slices of time contain observers that have a feeling that time is passing, even if you believe that the four-dimensional reality is there. And a similar story can be told in quantum mechanics, even if time is not fundamental, even if something like the Wheeler-DeWitt equation is right rather than the Schrodinger equation. These are technical terms for those of you who are not familiar, but in the Wheeler-DeWitt equation version of quantum mechanics, time does not appear. But it's very easy to come up with schemes whereby you define an effective, emergent, approximate version of time based on quantum entanglement, 
uh, that can give all of the things that you ordinarily get from the time coordinate in ordinary relativity. It gets technical and we don't know that necessarily the right way to do it, but we know ways to do it. And so the question is not, can it be done? But if is it what needs to be done? And if so, what is the right way to do it? All right, so we also got a question about um, work that your uh, your partner on Many Worlds, Trip Sebens, has been doing on many interacting worlds, which is a, a closely related theory, a sort of a hybrid of Bohm and Everett uh, that's been developed by Howard Wiseman's group uh, in Australia and also by uh, Bill Poirier's group. I can't remember where they are. Um, so yeah, if you can give any comments about what you think of Many Interacting Worlds and maybe try to explain briefly what it is. Um, I can neither explain what it is nor give any comments on it. Uh, it seemed like I've heard talks on it. And while I was in the talk, I was like, oh, yes, that sounds interesting. But then it just, it just, you know, it's not what I work on. And like I said, uh, my brain space within the foundations of quantum mechanics is devoted to pushing Everett forward rather than exploring alternatives. So I encourage everyone else to check it out. It's an interesting idea uh, that I would not dare to explain. I know, Matt, could you explain it? I don't know. You're, you're muted, Matt, so yes. you can't explain it. Uh, <laughs> Could I explain it? Um, I mean, I think it's, it's kind of a strange uh, interpretation, not one that I would immediately think of. Um, you know, that it goes back to this sort of original idea of Bohm. So in the, in the Bohm theory, you have a wave function and you also have a particle. And you have to assume in this theory that um, at, you know, at the beginning of time, particles were distributed according to the Born rules, mod psi squared distribution, uh, and then, then they will continue to do that over time. So, um, the, the, you know, so for any given wave function evolution, in Bohmian mechanics, there's a bunch of different tra trajectories that a particle could take, depending on where it happened to start, okay? And generally you say, well, only one of those trajectories happened. You could instead say, no, actually, there's a bunch of different particles, um, and all of those trajectories are realized, right? They don't interact with each other in this picture. They don't interact with each other. So we just have all these different particles, and then you have sort of a many worlds, a, a pa many parallel worlds type of picture. Uh, somehow, each of these collections of particles exists in its own own world. Uh, that was proposed by Peter Holland um, a long time ago, um, but never really taken very, very seriously. Um, now the idea here in the many interaction worlds is you take that picture and you start to allow these different collections of particles to interact with each other. And by doing so, you can get a dynamics which acts just directly on the particles. So no wave functions. The wave functions are gone. You just have these, what, what the wave function would have done is, is um, taken account of by sort of the, these interactions that occur between these different worlds, which are mostly isolated, but they at times interact with each other quite strongly. Um, and in some ways that's appealing, and I haven't really gotten my head fully around this, but I have a feeling that this might count as a, as a theory in which the wave function is not real. Um, it's sort of more informational because you just have these particles and, and their interactions. What, I, what I've never fully understand is whether it's actually possible to at least approximately reconstruct the evolution of the wave function from these particle trajectories and how they interact. If that's so, then you know, the wave functions. Yeah, I could jump in and say that, uh, at least in Bill Poirier's version of it, the, the idea kind of from the start is to get rid of the wave function, but still reproduce all of the- Yeah, I know, but you can get the wave well, rid of the wave function explicitly but it might still be there implicitly, right? It's like, uh, you know, it's a formalism. In the formalism, the wave functions don't appear, but it might be that uh, you could still, like if I give you the trajectories of the particles and, how they, and the rules for how they interact, it might be possible to at least reconstruct an approximate version of the wave function from that. And if that's true, then at least in the sort of terminology that I use, that doesn't count as the wave function not being real. It counts as being real and having a very different status to what it has in something like Everett. It's sort of more an emergent thing from the particle trajectories, but it's still, it's not, uh, com it, you can't compare the wave function to something like a probability in that, um, 
from that kind of point of view. So it's unclear to me at the moment what's true about that theory. Um, but at least it removes the wave function from being an explicit, sort of very explicit part of the fundamental uh, reality of the, of the theory. So. All right, so another question related to the uh, timeline evolution is uh, what happens to the wave function in uh, your version of Everett, Sean, uh, when you change reference frames? Uh, does the many worlds interpretation identify uh, as a universal wave function theory and what happens to that wave function in different frames? Yeah, well, to be super duper clear, um, the wave function is what matters. Frames are something that happen within space-time and space-time is emergent from the wave function. So there's, you need to be able to translate all these equations, all these questions into a wave function kind of question, not a space-time kind of question. So the wave function equivalent of saying, what would, how would you describe things in a different reference frame is saying, how would you describe things in a different factorization of Hilbert space? And to make sense of those words, what you mean is Hilbert space is the space of all the possible wave functions, okay? All the possible vectors, all the possible functions that could describe reality. And when we factorize Hilbert space, that's what we do in quantum mechanics to talk about subsystems. So you're talking about what's going on in one place, what's going on in the other place, how they interact with each other and so forth. And you can show mathematically that what in space-time you would describe as a change of uh, the reference frame that you use in space-time can be accommodated in the quantum language by just changing your factorization in some clever way. So if you're going to reconstruct not just that there is space-time, but that it obeys the rules of relativity, then there has to be a symmetry somewhere hidden in the dynamics of your theory that lets you do that. And uh, figuring out that, that is true, and is it is it sort of natural, and things like that are all big research level questions. Okay. So another kind of fundamental question we have um, in Everett: Are you assuming already some fundamental factorization of all of the systems in the universe into basic systems, or is that somehow emergent? Uh, can you say anything about sort of top down ontology versus bottom up ontology for factorization of systems? Right. Um, I should say you should read my most recent paper, which I talked about uh, with Ashmeet Singh. The, the title of it was literally Quantum Muriology. Muriology is the study of the relationship between holes and their parts. And it's all about how you start with a wave function that is not in some fundamental division into subsystems. And you can find out what the best way to divide the subsystems is. Um, we have some results about that. It's actually, it's super duper interesting actually to me because what, what I, I'm not completely sure this is true, but it's so interesting to let me say it anyway, because it might be true and we're trying to figure it out. You know, one longstanding question uh, that you might want to ask is why do we live in position space rather than momentum space, right? And you know, in classical mechanics, you can describe particles and fields or whatever by giving their positions and by also giving their momenta. And there are formulations like the most high powered formulations of classical mechanics treat positions and momenta equally. Like they're, you can exchange them for each other. There's no fundamental difference between them. But in the real world, there's a very clear difference between locations and velocities in the world, right? So what, what Ashmeet and I suspect might be true is that given our way of, of factorizing the universe into a system and then its environment, all the stuff around it that sort of monitors it, um, and the fact that you want a classical limit to emerge, what we think is true is that some classical theories can possibly emerge from an Everettian scheme and some don't. And the, the classical kinds of theories that can possibly emerge from quantum mechanics, we think, are those where position is very different than momentum. The position variable plays a fundamental role in making classicality possible. Um, so there might actually be, you know, uh, principled reasons why you choose to divide the world into subsystems in a particular way. That way is not given to you ahead of time in ever writing quantum mechanics as I do it. Other people might do it different ways. All right, I've got another question here. Um, this is about post-quantum theories where we might uh, adjust the math and go to a nonlinear version of quantum mechanics. Do you think that many worlds can survive that change? If you went to maybe like a, uh, well, part of the question is about collapse models. Those obviously wouldn't be many worlds models. So maybe you could imagine some hybrid. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine lots of things, but again, 
my attitude is, I think Everett's probably right. <laughs> I'm glad that other people are working elsewhere, but I'm nowhere close to fully understanding however it matches onto the real world. So I'm just not spending a lot of time worrying about whether, uh, you know, if, if something else is going to replace it. If it is, then I'll change my mind. I'll work on that. That has happened before in the past. I've got one more question um, that I'm not entirely sure I know what the question is. So I'm going to kind of read what the, what the person wrote and see if you can parse it out. So there was a paper on the experimental um, quantum trajectories from 2019. The quote is to catch and reverse a quantum jump mid-flight. And the question was, uh, does the conclusion in that paper present any conflicts uh, for the basic tenets of quantum mechanics? No. <laughs> no, it does not. Um, it's just, you know, look, if it depends. I guess, you know, the short answer is no. The longer answer is it depends. And that's the answer to almost every difficult question in physics. It depends what you mean about the fundamental precepts of quantum mechanics, right? Because as you've seen, not everyone agrees on what those uh, assumptions are. It certainly does not in any way challenge my view of the Everett interpretation, okay? Uh, where all you have is the wave function evolving smoothly under the Schrodinger equation. Uh, the, and the same thing I could say for um, things like the delayed choice quantum eraser experiment, or uh, the you know, there's a recent uh, experiment. Uh, ah, I'm forgetting their names. Matt's going to remember their names. The um, the the souped up Wigner's friend experiment. Um, all of these are perfectly compatible with Everettian quantum mechanics as it currently understood. The only way that things seem uh, weird is if you sort of uh, elevate things like collapses of the wave function to primitives in your ontology. And ever it doesn't do that, so it has no problems. All right, we have, I think, one final question here, since we're about on time. Um, this is a little bit of a lighthearted question. So Simon Saunders doesn't drink when, uh, wine when he's out because it would lead to a branch where he drunk drives. Have you altered your life <laughs> behavior in any way after starting to study many worlds? No, because that's a very good question. But, you know, actually, I discussed this in the book. There's a whole chapter about, you know, morality and ethics in an Everettian uh, multiverse. But the conclusion that I came to is for sensible sets of moral rules, you should act in an Everettian multiverse in exactly the same way you should in a world with truly chancy, unpredictable, stochastic random outcomes, but only a single world. So if Simon thinks that, I mean, the, the question you should ask Simon is, what you're saying is if ever it is wrong, there's a chance that you would get drunk and commit drunk driving and, and kill someone. And so how big does that chance have to be before you don't have a glass of wine, right? And again, there's a chance that you'll have wine and that will give you a brilliant idea and you'll solve global warming. So, you know, these it's the rare uh, things that should not be foremost in your mind when you take these considerations into account. If you drink enough wine that you will probably drive under the influence in an unacceptable way, then just don't drink that much wine would be my advice. Yeah, I think we should probably um, leave the questions there because uh, we've probably taken up enough of Sean's time and I'm very grateful um, that you came and was, were our guinea pig for our first one of these uh, online events. It's been fun to do something that uh, feels like more normal, <laughs> more yeah. normal world type of, type of things. Um, so uh, before we go, uh, do you want to uh, tell people about where they can follow you online and things like that, as well as, as of course, they should buy your book, but uh, any, where they want to get updates about what you're up to? Sure, there is the book. Um, you know, the most active place I'm on uh, the internet right now is actually on Twitter at Sean M. Carroll. Um, but also this summer, my project was I made some YouTube videos about the biggest ideas in the universe where I talk about quantum mechanics, but also classical mechanics, uh, Hamiltonians and uh, cosmology and complexity and a whole bunch of things. And the, the special thing about these videos is that I'm not a afraid of equations. So I don't teach you the equations in all the detail, but I will write equations down and try to explain what all the different terms mean. So it's a little bit more oomph than a traditional popular science approach, although less than a full-blown textbook take the course approach. So you can check those out on YouTube. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Um, I just wanna conclude by saying we are planning to do more of these events. I'm trying to do about one a month, which was the frequency that we had our public lectures. Um, due to the current 
chaotic situation. Things aren't fully organized for the rest of the semester, but um, uh, please uh, follow us and, and keep up to date. You can look on the IQS website. Um, and if you sent your email to the book giveaway, I can keep you uh, updated about what's going on uh, for the rest of the semester. Um, and I'm just gonna put up the, the QR code uh, for a few moments before I close the live stream for a few moments again, in case anybody needs to, um, in case anybody needs to get to look at that URL again uh, for entering the book giveaway. Um, but otherwise, uh, I, I wanna thank everybody who came to watch this event live. Uh, we had a decent number of viewers. It was, thank you for coming. Um, I hope you'll join us for future events. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, okay, we are off. <laughs>